This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Amy Gwynn. How are you, Amy? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I got a message from you a few years ago saying you were going to be on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fanboy, you know you're here. It's uh, good to have you on, kind of Liverpool female boss. You've done reality shows, you've got your own strip clubs. Um, yeah, which is kind of not odd to see, but you never really see women kind of running that industry. No, no, definitely Especially not. in Liverpool as well. Um but I believe Liverpool was at the first to have a strip club in the it UK. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you're taking a so mark, like, yeah. yeah. But Lots first and foremost, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. I'm just a bit nervous, but um, yeah, I'm good. Why are you nervous? Because it's you. <laughs> <laughs> but life is good. It is, yeah, yeah, it's treating me well. Good. Listen, before we get into everything though, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, get more a bit of understanding about you, Amy, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, um, I grew up in Liverpool. And my mum and dad, two younger brothers, pretty normal, um, normal childhood. Um, my, my dad was um, was at work a lot. He was really hard work and he'd jump from kind of like business to business, just like he was always just like a, a man in a van, you know, doing whatever he could to put food on the table. My mum was at home a lot. I was the eldest, uh, two younger brothers. I um, had a really, my dad was really strict with me. Which now, you know, looking back, I'm so grateful for because he really kind of like set me up. And I think maybe being the eldest, you kind of like it's that tough love with with the Mm face and being the only girl as well. Um, So he was, yeah, he was really strict growing up. Um, And I just had a normal, you know, uh, my mum was amazing. She was always there. I went to school. My brothers were both, um, my brothers were both really academic. They were quite clever. And I was like kind of like the black sheep. So I just plodded my way through school where I struggled. I struggled a lot. Um, I, I tried. I wasn't naughty. You know, I was, um, I wasn't needy, but I was really quiet and still was really even getting into this industry. So I was really shy to the point where it was almost like a little bit of a social disorder. You know, like if I go with places, I'd get really anxious and because I was just so, so like timid and quiet. Uh, I went through school. I had no confidence. I had to sit at the back of the class and I was just a daydream. I didn't know what I wanted to do, where I was going. But um, I tried, you know, I'd sit there and I'd go through these lessons and everyone would get their head down and they'd start working, James. And I'd just sit there and be like, what What are we doing? You know, I didn't, um, I just didn't seem to retain what was going on. So it, it suppressed me a little bit that I just thought like, maybe I'm just a bit, like a bit stupid, you know. Um it wasn't it wasn't until later later life when I had my own children that I realised that I got tested and I realised I was dyslexic um and had like ADHD as well. So my concentration was just like horrific. You know, I'd just be sat in the room trying to listen to something and I was thinking about something else looking out the window. So I left school um with no GCSEs really and it was shit. I remember like walking out um 
the school gates, you know, when I was I was a summer baby, so I was 15, walking out the school gates and looking and everyone else had, you know, done quite well and they were going off and I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And, you know, obviously you're only a baby, but I was looking, I was like, oh my God, like, well, that's it. Like, I don't think it, it dawns on you till you leave school that that's it now. No one's going to help you. There's no, there's no education. No one's going to sit down with you like you're on your own. And I remember going home and my dad said, well, you're going to have to get a job, aren't you? Like, I'm not giving you no money. Like, he was it, he was really tough. But in, in a, you know, in a good way. Like, I was really lucky. I had a, a lovely childhood. But I was like, okay. Um, so I did. I got three and just wiped his eye. And um, I, I just went, I remember looking through, like, the papers and just looking, looking through different jobs. And I ended up with three jobs. I was working in, like, the gyro, doing dishes um, in the kitchen. I went to an agency and got that job and then I got a weekend job in TJ's um, on London Road working. I had like a little department so I'd work there every weekend. And then I um, I found a scheme in the local pa- newspaper for um, like an apprenticeship, like a, I think they were called MVQs. So it's like work-based learning. So you would be placed at a workplace and go to college like one day a week. So you would learn whilst you were working. And I thought, well, that's probably better for me, like hands-on, because in a classroom environment, I just go to shit. I didn't understand at that point that I was dyslexic. I still didn't, um, wasn't sure what it was, why I was the way I was. I just knew I was a bit different. But I thought I was, you know, maybe not as clever as other people. So I um, I went and had this interview and I landed a place there was like three options so you could do like hair and beauty which a lot of girls went for I had no interest in that um child care definitely no interest in that and the other one was like business administration so I thought well I go with that my mum said to me well you know that's a great foundation to whatever you decide to to go into if you know that's never gonna it's always gonna put you in good stead for whatever it may be so I was really lucky I landed a place in um in Jacobs, so Jacobs is owned by McVitie's, you know, the like the crackers yeah. and everything. So it was a big company. Yeah, yeah. So it was a big company for me to go and work in. So obviously there was a lot of opportunities to to develop there. So um I went, there was quite a few of us. And it was great that that was that was a time that I really enjoyed. So um you got to move around departments of the business. So you go to college one day a week and then the other four days you get like they give you a bus pass and you go, Well, you were working for pennies, but I didn't care yeah. because I was working the weekends in TJs. Um, and then I was working nights in these kitchens and things. So I was just constantly, I'm like, I just turned 16 at this point and I'm working every single hour, James. And I was like right the way through, but I loved it. I never felt like I missed out on anything. Like I felt like when I was there, I was just like, I was I was doing what I was supposed to do. So I was able to move around this business and go from um, like HR, or human resources to buy in and then I, I ended up in the um accounts like finance department and it was manufacturing accounts so you were looking at the, the actual factory and the you know the losses and what it was generating how much downtime we were having so I'd get taken into meetings with all like the factory line managers and I'd sit there and write notes and I'd go back to the desk and I had I had a real like feel for the for numbers. I was good. That was the only thing I was good at in school was, was numbers. I like playing with numbers. I was shit when it got to like algebra and things, but when it was just numbers, I was fine. So it was the money side of the finance department that even though it wasn't my business, it got me excited and I used to get really competitive with myself and think, right, you know, biscuits for cheese has lost this this week. Next week we're going to improve. And I'd go right, I'd put this hairnet on and go around the factory. We're putting these like smiley face charts up and the managers would be like, fuck off. You know, like trying to turn them around and things because they'd have a sad face for that week. And um, yeah, I, I loved it. I love being in that department and I thought maybe this is what I need to do then. Maybe I go into finance, accountancy. So um, on top of working the weekends, I enrolled myself into um, a business accounts course on a Tuesday evening for an hour a week. So I went back to like the like my, my line manager and I told them because I wanted to get kept on, James, because it was like 10 of us. We're all there for 12 months and then you get you complete your course and you get fucked off but obviously if you show grace initiative and you're really good there's a chance that you're going to get kept on and I was like this is a great company for me to start out you know it can develop me so um I was doing the course and I'm working in TJ's and then the 
I love that as well because I was, they gave me a Sunday to myself. So I started running, I was in like a concession. So I'd run that on my own on a Sunday. The buses wasn't, the buses wasn't on. So my dad had dropped me off. So it was great because I was on double pay. My dad had dropped me off. I didn't have to get the bus and I get there and I felt so grown up and I was still only 16, but I was in charge of doing the stock take. And when I say a stock take, I had to count every single item of clothing and like write it. There was no computers or anything, you know, and I'd have to write it all down. I'd have to collect every single tag. But I loved having that responsibility. I felt like, like that, you know, this is, I used to pretend in my head, like, this is mine. This is my money. This is my stock. Like, this is, you know what I mean? It gave me like, like a, sense, like a real responsibility that I had something like I was in control of this. So um, I was doing that and I was working at Jacobs and then I did, I got, I got kept on then um, as a trainee accountant. So I'm now 17 and um, I'm working, you know, I've got a contract, I've sat down with the manager and I've got a contract and I'm a trainee accountant in this big company. Um, and they put me on then, I'd completed the, the business studies course, the business account, sorry. So they put me on to AAT. So I was really lucky that they were investing in me. They were developing me and I probably wouldn't have got back, you know, from a smaller, smaller company. So the AAT meant that I was going to train, you know, association accounts, technicians to become like basically like a bookkeeper because I didn't have a degree. I was never going to get a degree. I wasn't, you know, clever enough to go to university I didn't want to go to university I just wanted to work so um I'm doing that and it's all going well for about a year um and I'm, I'm working you know me other jobs and everything everyone around me is going out you know we're, t- we're 17 we're 10 and 18 and I was just like obsessed I was always like just wanted to be ahead So I was like really competitive with myself and I am, I'm a competitive person, but it's always with me. So I'll always look back at what I was doing last year and go like, no, that was shit. I want to do this and I want to, you know, um, and yeah, I was like doing my driving lessons and I was like, I'm going to pass my test. It took me three times because as you can see, I can't park. (laughs) Um, so I was like, I'm going to get my car. So I did. So I'm working. I'm still on like the shittest money. I've got no money because I've now got a car. I've got to pay my car insurance every month. But I'm flying. I'm like way ahead of everyone else. So that was that was my thing. You know, I didn't get off on going out and, and partying or whatever. I just wanted. They were the best years of my life. But that was what I wanted to do. That was what I felt like made me made me the happiest. So, um, yeah, I was there in this office and doing the accountant's course. And I got into my second year, so it was intermediate, so I still had another year on top of that to go. And I started struggling, like really struggling. It was going a little bit over my head and I started losing my way a little bit. What was? The the course, the accountants course. Mm-hmm. Um I was I was just losing I was it was it was getting a bit too difficult for me. So this was the thing, was put me in the workplace. I could put me in TJs on my own on a Sunday. I would absolutely smash it because I could I could organise, I could prioritise, and in work now I'm good at delegating things. I'm really disciplined, but put me in the classroom and a struggle. Like when I went, when I did send me to college one day a week, where I was, I was upstairs and I'd sit by the window. And this is like probably a huge part of the story, but I'd look out the window and there was a strip club over the road. So I'd never danced before. I'd never been never been a stripper. I'd, I'd done like child mod, like modelling as as you know as a kid but I'd never done dancing so I used to look over the road and I'd just be like wow like what goes on over there like and I used to just 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 daydream and be like just so like curious as to like what did the girls look like like how much money did they earn? like do they have sex with the customers like what you know so the teacher would be talking and I'd just go to shit you're getting absolutely nothing else of me like it was pointless sending me there half the time they'd give me the bus pass and I'd just go and walk around town and jib it because and sag because I wasn't I wasn't going to get anything else of me anyway but I'd look over the road, this strip club, and I'd just be like, wow, like, I wonder, you know, like, it's my wonder how much money they earn, wonder what they, you know, what they look like, so on. Um, so, yeah, I'm doing this AAT course, and I'm struggling, I'm struggling a lot, and I'm trying to hold this job down and do the weekend job, but it, it all gets a little bit much, and I'm, um, I'm still only 17 as well, so there's a lot of, I've put a lot of pressure on myself. And I start, like, I'm in this department, because I've been kept on, all the other ITs have now gone, I, I got kept on. And I'm working with people who are a lot older than me, you know, probably even older than me now. 
and their lives were just so boring and what what I, I got onto was that it was they were so limited like they would you know they would just talk about like what's going on I don't know saving for this and that and it just really dawned on me then that um I could work and do this and struggle for three years and I would still only be a bookkeeper because I hadn't gone to university and I was like limited at like 16k a year and I was like what's the fucking point like this is shit you know it's not this is not what I want I want I want a life where I can I wanted the freedom to be able to do what I want to work um and I realized that I wasn't gonna I wasn't really gonna get that I was working really hard and at the end of it there was no do you know what I mean? There was no huge reward. It was just that that was going to be me. So um, I started getting like itchy feet and stuff. So um, I left and I didn't still didn't know what I was going to go and do. So I went to work for my dad for a little bit. So I was helping him and I was in the office and um, he was working with like insurance companies at the time and he had the vans going out. So I was watching, I was around my dad had always been like a man in a van. He was always like, he had my uncles working for him. There was always men around the house working. And so I grew up as like kind of like one of the lads. And my dad had raised me in a van, you know, going out and he'd take me to these jobs and he'd be like, listen, girl, we're going to get this out of this. And you've got to get that room and that room's flooded. So tell them the next room's flooded and that's what. And it was all about like maximizing, you know, everything that yeah. you could. So I was there and um, I went out one night I went to a place called the News Bar and um, it just opened my eyes a little bit to like this glamorous life that I'd kind of been missing out on. I thought maybe I should like go back into modelling. You know, maybe that's what, what I should do because I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So I did. Um, I went and got a portfolio done. Now back then it wasn't as easy as what it is now. So there was no Instagram. You know, there was no like paid posts. There was no um instagram models there was no airbrushing and filters and all those kind of things it was dead raw like you li you literally had to go and find a photographer go and get your photographs taken and go go and turn up to an agency and hand them you know hand them in didn't you so um i done that and i went and luckily enough i got taken on um started doing bits of modeling and pr work and things so that was great because the money was a lot better so i was working and um i left tj's at that point and started focusing on on the modeling and I enjoyed it. It was fun and it was nice. It was nice to feel, to feel nice. And, um, anyway, I started getting booked for these jobs and then this photographer started booking me for jobs cause I drove and some of the other girls didn't drive. He started booking me for these jobs in Manchester. And what it was, was it was, um, like photographers who were training. They would go to him to train to, in photography. So I would be the model on my shoot. So he'd set up like these workshops and I'd drive down and, you know, obviously get paid and just stand around and people would take photographs and then I'd drive back home. So I was doing that. I had absolutely no life, but I was still, I was stacking money and that's what I wanted to do. And I thought that was what was going to bring me happiness. So I'm doing that and that's going on for a few months. And then it was just one night, James, I was driving home and I just had like this, this idea just popped into my head. And I thought, what if I done the same? but the other way around. So what if I done the workshops, but for the girls and got girls who, because I had, because it, it was my space at the time, do you remember my space? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'd have girls, <laughs> I'd have girls message me saying like, how did you, how do you get it? Because no one wants to go and find out the answers. They want, they want to go and ask someone, you know, I'd done it the hard way. Um, so they were like, how did you, get into modeling how did you get your portfolio who did you go to what and i was like i'm even all this fucking advice away for free like I, I could set these workshops up in liverpool and book these girls and put a package together so i had a lot of contacts with photographers with studios through you know doing it myself so i did i um i got in touch with one of the photographers that i was working with like an amateur photographer who i knew i could get you know at a good price i secured a um a studio and um I started, I made a page and I called it Model Days and I went and got like flyers made and started pushing it. So um, I went into town with these flyers and spent about two days in town, handing them all out, hundreds of girls. And I went home and I was like, looking at my phone, I was like, that's it. Like, 
lost my everyone will ring now and I'll book them all in and no one rang and I remember because like that's what you had to do there was no Instagram then do you know what I mean you had to go and literally hand flyers out and go and speak to people didn't you um but I carried on with it and I was promoting it and and um I ended up getting done the first workshop and I got about six girls and it was great and um, I started doing them monthly then and they become really popular and I get a lot of girls coming in and some of them didn't necessarily want to be models they just wanted to come and get some nice pictures you know or some portfolio shots or just come and have a, a nice day so um I started doing that so I'd work through the week and then I'd spend say like a month promoting the next one and getting things booked in and I remember doing my first one and coming home, I told my dad, you know, what my idea was. So I was taking something that I was interested in, which was modelling, something that I enjoyed. But rather than being behind the camera and being told what to do, I was taking charge of it and I was in control of it and I was calling the shots and that's what excited me. So um, I remember coming home after the first one, sorry, and um, I had like 600 quid and I'm like, 18, 19 at the time and I come home to my dad and I was like and I put it on the table and he was like fucking hell is right girl and I was like he was like smashing it and I, I like I was buzzing I was so proud of myself and I carried on and like I wasn't spending this money I wasn't going out you know I had my car and that was it and I was like just stacking money in like and, like it was in my underwear drawer just like wads of money by the time I was like 18, 19 I remember thinking like seeing these girls who done well at school you know, you, you were great. You were flying while I was sat at the back of the class, just like staring out the window. And and they wasn't doing so great. And they were messaging me like, "Is right, you're smashing it." And I was thinking, "Why? How is this not obvious? How am I smashing it?" But yeah, I, I was the fucking the stupid one. Like these are all dead clever. You know, and it was because I didn't understand then my mind that I was just completely fearless. But your dad would have helped with that. So Definitely, you know, yeah, so yeah. You'll probably have a lot of your dad's traits. Yeah. By spending time with him, the entrepreneurship. No matter what it is you're doing, no matter if it's washing windows or selling watches, it's still you've got to have something about you to make those sales and go out and make those money. It's like a local deal, boy, isn't it? You're just out hustling. Yeah, and of you course. You can do it at different scales from the bottom to the top, but you've obviously picked up those traits of want to make money how to make money and how to be a business yeah woman. yeah um no definitely like as i say he, he was hard on me he was strict but it, why are you I was, though um i think because like i was adult, i was the only he did treat well my me, younger brother was gay so me, <laughs> 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 um, i think it was because i was first born and i was his only daughter uh -huh. um but yeah he, he passed everything on to me and he did he raised me like a man you know to be really strong and his own sisters are ruthless like the scary women you know so i think he was just like because he come from he was one of nine you know he was like his mum and dad were both out working all the time they raised themselves so he was like listen i come from fucking this you know that you, so he was quite hard in that way but even to this day i think i always wanted to impress him so even now i'll be like dad i've done this and he's he's you know he's like oh that's great dad and he is really proud and he'll have a little brag and stuff but he's still like yeah but you know it's always and that's great to get more yeah yeah and i'm i've i'm like that and i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but i've never, never ever yeah never satisfied and it's not that i'm not money driven anymore it's just that i always want to do more and do better and i've never stopped and gone wow because i think you don't see it yourself you know yeah. when you're like I, I you know i was speaking to you and i'm saying like but you're james english and you're just like yeah but because you don't see that progression that you make yourself you know yeah. um so yeah so doing these 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 model shoots and everything can I'm smashing in, it's going great, making money. Um, and then I I I was I had my, my boyfriend at the time, um I was still together now, like 18 years on. Um he was a DJ around town. So, you know, obviously I'm doing this model, and so naturally you end up with a DJ boyfriend and you're out, you know, and he was working in a club called the Pleasure Rooms, which was like the, it was iconic. It was like big scouse house. Used to go down to Glasgow a lot. Um, Victoria's, Silvers, all those kind of places every weekend. My dad used to be bounce on Victoria's. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I went there. Yeah, it was, yeah, place it was. A Sunday night. I went there Fucking a few times. Yeah, unbelievable. Well, they love all the scouse house down yeah, there. Yeah, they yeah, all yeah, the dance yeah, yeah. music mm -hmm. and that. Um, so yeah, we, we were like complete opposite, you know. So he was like out doing his DJ, and, and I was like so sensible, and um, I was doing the modelling, but I wasn't like his, what you would imagine, you know. I wasn't out partying. I was like doing that, and then I was back in work Monday to Friday. So we were complete, you know, opposites. Um, and then I ended up pregnant at like twenty one. So he's working. I have this baby, and um, I leave work. 
I'm in the house. We, my mum and dad moved. So we, I moved as well to follow my mum and dad. So I've moved now from one side of Liverpool that I grew up on to the, the other side. I'm still there now. But I knew no one. Like I'd literally, it was like moving cities. Like it was completely different. So I, I know no one. I've had this baby. I'm now isolated. I've gone from just working, you know, Carl's out working nights. My mum and dad are both in work and I'm at home with this baby. I don't know the top from the bottom. Like I was petrified. She just used, she'd cry, I'd cry. I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Like it wasn't planned. My life was not meant to be like that. So my confidence just nosedived because I was no longer in control of my life. So um, I'm off work. I'm depressed as fuck because I'm not meant to be off work. You know, I'm meant to be out grafting. That's what I do. That's who I am. Um, so I just kind of thought like, oh, well, I'll have to, I don't know, she'll have to go to nursery and I'll have to go back to accounts and go back to my old life because I'm a mum now, that's what you do, you know, and I think back now and I think, oh, freaking Ellie, of course, you could have gone back to doing what you were doing. I think I've just, you know, lost my head a bit, I was yeah, scared. Yeah, it's a show, can it? Yeah, yeah. Still a kid yourself. Well, I was, yeah, and um, so my mum was amazing, but she was still working, so she was trying to help me. Um, I remember like going to a baby class and I, my mum had to come with me because I'd gone back, James, to having no confidence again. I couldn't, like, speak. And because i go in these baby classes and I felt like everyone knew what they were doing. They, it was, they were married. It was planned. And I'm just like, oh, I got with a DJ and got pregnant and this got this baby. And, so, you know, don't know what I'm doing. So my mum my mom came with me and I'd just sit there. I was just, yeah, I was just so, had no confidence whatsoever was sat in this house all day like by myself with this baby just yeah and um Carl come home one day so obviously he's working he's still working in the club scene and um he was like oh speaking to me mate and um if you open a strip club so we, we were renting we were living in a one-bedroom flat um I was on maternity leave and his kind of career was news diving a little bit because the culture of music Changing. changed around that time around 2009 so it went from Scouse House to like funky house and things so everyone was going to different kind of clubs and it was really weird because everyone went from like the 05 the pleasure rooms to like society which weirdly enough is where rude is housed now in this that that's that, that's its home um so yeah he, he he wasn't earning the money he was in and all of a sudden we'd gone from like he was earning great money i was doing well we had all this freedom till we had nothing we're in this one bedroom flat my mum and dad were trying to help us as much as they could but obviously we had our pride as well um i was walking around with dolly and like a a what is it like a car a car seat that i'd been given off my uncle and it was blue because he had a son so everyone thought she was a boy because i couldn't afford to buy a, a one that you know like a grey one or a pink but whatever um, and she used to sleep in this car seat and sleep at the bottom of the bed because she didn't have a car so we, we, we just had nothing and um, I'd go around like the supermarket and my mum would give me some money and that. I remember like walking around with like 50 pounds like get baby milk and nappies and whatever was left was left for the week you know we just we just kind of it just like a full circle turned around you know so um, we, we managed to save this bit of money that was gonna go towards like get a mortgage because again it was just like I was brought up that you get a job you get a car you get married you, that that you know that's what you do so you get a mortgage you get married you, and it's not till you get older that you realize that like it's all bullshit like you don't have to do any of those things you know but I, I that's what I thought like I have to do this 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 and tick all those boxes so we're like well, we've got the baby we've got to get a mortgage so we had this little bit of money but no no income coming in so um anyway he come in one day and he started talking about strip clubs and he was like you can earn a lot of money off them because you've got different ways of, of earning revenue so you know you, you you've got your your bar you can charge on the door because you're offering naked women and you've got these you know girls that you you take like a commission or a fee off them and i don't even remember the conversation james i don't know if i was just that low that tired whatever but next thing you know, we're working. So he was working in the pleasure room. So the, the pleasure rooms was closing. So we had the bottom floor of this club. It was tiny. Um, and he was like, we can move it into there. We didn't need to pay a lease for like 12 months. So we could literally kind of move in for free because we had no money. We just had to do it up. So next thing we're doing this club. So it was one of them like say yes and just fucking work it out later, you know. So um, 
I was like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just do that for it. I don't know what I thought. Like, I'll just do it for a little bit and then I'll go back to like normal life. I don't know. I was there for the money, nothing else. You know, I'm not, I didn't, I'm no hero. I, I did just go into it for, to earn money. So um, I remember thinking, well, I, I've got all these contacts within the modeling, you know, industry. And I, I know some girls who are dancers. I'll, I'll put a like, message out on Facebook. I'll do whatever. I'll find the girls. So I did. I started speaking and I found five girls. So um, we're doing this club. We haven't got a fucking pot to piss in. Um, it was awful. It was dreadful. Like I remember thinking, like, do you remember Ed Hardy years ago? Mm. I was like, I think, I think it was black to be honest, but I found this like Ed Hardy wallpaper somewhere and I was like, oh, that's that cool. Like I'll, I'll do the whole club in Ed Hardy. Like it was shocking, absolutely shocking. And um, I found these five girls anyway. And I remember going down to audition them. Now I, at this point, I've never been a dancer. I've never been in a strip club. So I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm looking for. So I'm sat there and I said to them, like, oh, uh, do you want to do a dance? I took my friend with me because I was so nervous. Um, and these girls come and they start dancing. I remember, like, shitting myself. This one girl, she actually went on to be like a porn star. She starts dancing. I still remember the song. It was Jason Derulo in my head. And every time it comes on, like, it just gives me flashbacks. She starts dancing, she takes a bra off and then she whips her knickers off and I was like, whoa, it's okay, it's okay, you know. I just, I think it was so mad, I just didn't know what I was getting into, but I was just like, oh, whatever, you know. Um, so anyway, I took all these five girls on because who was I not to? Like, I didn't fucking, I didn't know what I was doing, do you know what I mean? So I took them all on and um, we, we, opened, we opened the club and it was dreadful. I remember um, I, I had a bar and then it was almost like, just like because it was so small, I had like this seating here and then these booths. And I got this curtain woman to come in. And in my head, I was like, So men will come in and they'll see the girl, and the girl will go up and then they'll get a drink and then they get a dance. So they'll go over there. So I was like, Put a curtain across the club, just like right across the club. So you've got this tiny room that's now halved in size because I put a curtain across it. So the men come in. Um, I think it was like four hours and I was stood there and there was no customers and I was like flapping and I was going into the girls and I remember um, we because I didn't have any money we had to get the stock on tick and then pay it you know like after we'd sold it and get a bit of money I remember going into the change rooms and I was like can I get you a drink and you were like yeah I'll have a rosé wine and I was like I haven't got any but I didn't want to tell them we didn't have any so I run I literally legged it down to the office to buy a, a bottle of rosé wine to give them this wine and um I didn't realise that that's just how it is. Sometimes you don't get customers in for a few hours. Sometimes, you know, but I'm, I'm like, oh my God, please stay. Like, And then uh, these customers come in and it was awful because I'd set it up like a like a doctor's waiting room. You know, like it was a bench and a bar. So these fellas are sat there and then the curtains over there. So they were all kicking off because, naturally because it was it was shit. So, um, yeah, the curtain went. I had to call the woman up a few days later. And I was like, oh, the curtain's got to go. And then I made another booth. And, um, yeah, it was, it was dreadful. And I was getting these girls. And I think people got, the girls got wind that it was a young girl who didn't have a clue that was running this club and that they could run rings around me. So all of a sudden, I got all these dancers who were probably my age now. So they'd been in the industry for about 10 years. Um, 22 at this point. I'm working there, we're open three nights a week. Um, I'm working there every single night. We've got no money, so I'm having to be at the barman and doorman and everything else. I was like, I was on the door taking the money. I'm running the girls, I'm booking the shifts in, I'm cleaning. So I had to do learn every aspect of my business, which I think now is great, do you know what I mean? Because there's no job that I ask anyone else to do that I haven't done, that I don't fully understand. So I had to learn everything. But I also had to learn how it worked, how men worked, how the girls worked. And these girls were... They were, they were lovely girls and they all had each other's back. There was this real sense of like, like sisterhood between them, but not with me because I was... You know, I was the boss, as quiet and nice and everything that I was. I was the woman that was coming in. How old were you? I was 22. Yeah, so they're not going to take orders. Listen, a lot of people wouldn't take orders from, know, from a, a woman. female. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. never mind. And it's no disrespect to women, but that's just the way it yeah, is. Yeah. The workplace, never mind a 22-year-old kid. Yeah, yeah. Did you see that um, kind of respect? be lost straight away mm, 100% um, there was no there was no respect for me at all because the way they looked at it is you're not a dancer 
this is and they were very precious over their industry and now i completely understand why um but they were like this is our industry we built this industry there was no one there to protect them they had to stick together because this was an industry that you know let's be honest was created by a man to exploit women that's what it was it's men going in and then it's women trying to you know, stay on top of that and earn a living and go through all the shit that they have to go through. Who did create you? that? Who did create the kind of strip places? I don't know because when you obviously you it know must you be go back, back hundreds and thousands. Yeah, of years. that's it. Well, we, when you go back, the the, the answer it's not the answers are not clear because mm. gentlemen's clubs have always been there. You know, in mm -hmm. this industry, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's li it is obviously massively linked to the sex industry. It's one of the longest standing industries, and it's one of the you know the first industry known to woman. Really, it was the first job they ever really done. So, you'll never get a clear answer because gentlemen's clubs, even today in different countries mean different things, don't they? So, you know, we can get customers, international customers, and they'll come in and they'll go out because they're like, you can't have sex with the girls. And you're like, sorry. But in some countries, you, you can still do that. So it's difficult to know when it really come about. Mm. Um, But yeah, so these girls, they would just, James, it was shocking. Like, I'd be, they'd come in, they were charging whatever they wanted. They were getting off whenever they wanted. And I'm stood there, they're in hundreds of pounds. Back then it was cash. You know, it was now it's, you know, it's mainly car, but it was a lot of cash back then. So they're walking out with envelopes, just wads of cash everywhere. Um, they're just like wiping the floor with me. And I'd go in and I'd be like, right, I'm going to have a meeting. I'm going to speak to them. And more and more girls were coming. So weirdly enough, they all kind of come from this one club. And then I now own that club. But it was just how it, I didn't go and poach those girls. I didn't, like, I didn't have the balls to do that. Who was your competitor? How many clubs were there at this point? Um, at this point, I think there was eight. Now there's only about, I think, six in Liverpool. And I've got three of them. Yeah, because there was like three, four hundred in the UK a few years ago. Yeah, I yeah. Think. Only yeah, since, yeah, since COVID it was that mm. it so everybody's killed. only fans now. But yeah, but we were all closed for so long and I was mm. the only one in the UK that opened in COVID um, in, under the mm. under restrictions. Um, but I, I, I found a way around it, shall we say. So I opened in COVID, so I survived. I had to survive being the, now the biggest in the UK. I had no choice, James. I had to open. Mm. So... Um, yeah, I was like working with these girls and they, they just ruled me because they were so hardened. As I say, I was petrified because they'd just tell me straight and they'd be like, I'm not working that. I'm, and like, I'd be sat there doing the door and they'd be getting off and they'd earn like 500 quid. And I'm like, oh, can I have 40 pounds, please? You know, and then reality kicked in that actually I've got to pay the rent on this place and soon I've got to pay for this lease and that stock's got to be. And I was learning fast that it come with so many bills there was so much pressure and these girls were just running rings around me and I'd hold these meetings and they'd all talk over me and I was like, I was petrified, you know, I'd, I'd speak to them and they'd like really get up in my face and like my heart would be pounding and it, it was not enjoyable. I used to like pull up outside on Duke Street and just think like, oh, I don't want to do this, but the money was there and then I'd go home and I was still at home with that baby through the week so I was miserable because I felt like I was almost being terrorised in work by these girls and then I'd go home and it was like I had no one and I was thinking like I just just want you to be nice to me I just want a friend like I want someone to talk to you know and I'd go home with Dolly and just you know I'd drop her off I, I, I'd go to baby groups and I ended up again like isolating myself because I'd be so tired I'm working nights I'm getting up taking her to these places and then people would be like what you do? And I was embarrassed. I couldn't. I was like, how do I explain this crazy world that I'm in to someone and go like, I, I was already really shy anyway to go, I will run, I will run a strip club. Like, you know, and then I used to think like people are going to think I was a dancer and obviously I wasn't a dancer. And like now that's not, you know, I wouldn't be asked anyway. But it was like, even the club, I wasn't taken seriously because I wasn't a dancer. So who was I to tell them what to do and how to do it? Because... I, I didn't understand this game. That was their industry and I was an imposter coming in. Another woman, you know, had I been a man, they would have maybe listened to me a little bit more because that's what they were used to. But it was another woman who wasn't one of them. And, you know, the nitty gritty is they're going into the booth, getting naked and I'm taking their money, you know. But then I'm going home and I'm dropping Dolly off at nursery or whatever and I'm like, 
people I'm, I'm isolating myself because I'm dreading the question of so what is it you do because I don't want to tell people in fear of being judged I'm embarrassed um like oh, I'm not going to do this forever I'm just going to do this for a little bit and then I'm going to go back to like my, you know my normal life why are you embarrassed about that because yeah. I just because I don't know. I, I think how clubs was back then is that they wasn't talked about. So you look at strip clubs, they were always down like side roads and parts of that's due to licensing, which is understandable. You can't have them on a main road where there's maybe schools, children, whatever. So it was always perceived as being quite seedy. And I was too, because maybe because I was young, I was too consumed in what people would think of me. And you've got this baby and you're, you're only a young girl and you're running a strip club. You're clearly a stripper. You're... And now, like, I'm in my 30s, I'm like, why was I asked? I can move a fuck, you know what I mean? As long as, like, my dog loves me and my cat loves me, like, I don't really care. How was it? Because I know you've got daughters, but when you see your daughter and then you see the women in the strip clubs, because the majority of them, listen, some of them are breadheads. But mm. when I used to party back in the day, it was a lot of strippers. It was everybody was fucking on at the coke and the booze. We didn't give a fuck. It's kind of lost soul meets lost soul. Everybody's kind of lost that. Did you ever see the these girls kind of lost with reality and kind of yeah, yeah. their backgrounds and then obviously your daughter and thinking well I don't want my daughter really doing that no disrespect to any stripper or only fans yeah, or stars I'm friends with many of them but it's um some of them are on it though some of them maybe you, you know yourself people go to university they're just trying to get yeah. by before you know it they've left university they're making too much money and they end up staying there but did you see yeah, yeah. they kind of lost souls doing that job as well I did but I didn't Id identify that at the time so as I got older I'm kind of got more experience with the girls i come to understand that the reason they were so hardened was because they'd been treated so badly and they come with issues and this industry wasn't well regulated it wasn't structured so it was a job that and still is to some 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 points that you could jump in and out of so it wasn't taken seriously so girls would when i you know when i rocked up girls would turn up as and when they wanted, work whenever they wanted. They, they the night was a party. They get pissed. They were probably you know they were getting on it. They were going back with fellas. They were doing whatever. So that the job consumed them. Once you're a dancer and you've got this money, you've got this you know it's cash getting thrown at you. You've got these men. You're partying every night and it's like fuck it. What are we gonna do? I'm just gonna rock up when I want. I can't sack them. So if I've got no girls, I've got no club. So. Where that was I had to kind of lay in the hallway being dragged through their life and being you know I wasn't one of them and thankfully as well I was never I never got into the drink I never got into the party with them because I was so consumed with the money so I wanted to be so and had I had done you know I think my life would have been a lot different because the thing is is like when you come in as a customer you're coming in for a party that night but this is my life and if I party with you, then I party every single... Do you, do you know what I mean? That's my that's my job. And that's what was happening with these girls was life was just one big party that they then can't navigate into the normal world. So the job consumes them. So it comes with all those issues because it's like being a footballer, you can only do this for a set amount of time. Do you know what I mean? You've only got your looks and your stamina to do that job because it's a hard job for so long. So um, they did, they come with all those issues. I am. Um, Did you get any grief from obviously listen, it's that industry as well? It can be ruthless from any other clubs or any other men. Did anybody ever show up and try and show up at a muscle to tell you to fuck off? No, no, I got so people done it the sly way. But again, do you know what? I'm grateful for it because now like, I'm untouchable, but people done it the sly way. So they would, other clubs would come in um, to check the club out. I got grassed up, like the girls are working on the side, like the ale is like watered down. She's not paying, you know, like it was like off the back of a lorry, um, all that, you know, shit. So I'd have, um, I'd had the police coming in all the time because I was brand new. So they were giving me a dog's life. So I had that and the girls. So, they done me the biggest favour in the world, James, because I knew that I was constantly being looked up, looked at, you know, so everything was totally legit, like squeaky, squeaky clean. I was so strict on, on everything because I had to be, because everyone was trying to kill me because it was just like, oh, she's a divvy, like, you know, she'll be easy to kind of, to get rid of her. Um, so I had all these eyes on me and everyone, um, but no, thankfully enough, never... Never in that sense, like I never felt threatened. The only time I ever felt scared or threatened, being honest, was the girls. Like I had, I had girls try and throw digs at me and stuff when they were rotten drunk and I'd be going in to get the house. But I put myself in those vulnerable positions because now I would never 
never do that you know I would never I used to walk into a change room with like 15 girls at the time and we was in this tiny club and I'd be like can I get your house fee and it was all cash so I'd be asking them for the money and they'd be like wow fuck off you know and I'd be stood there it was horrible so like I'd go home and I'd quit about five times like I was I was like so just like unhappy you know what I mean but then on the other hand I was earning so much money that I would never be able to earn them and I was I was like thinking to myself if I could earn this much I could do this and I was like bypassing all of that because I had no real competition the industry was so it was just so flat because it was run by men who were I don't know comfortable like these clubs have been going f for years and years they did not been decorated since the 80s like they were <laughs> shit holes because at the end of the day they've got naked women so if you're going to sell pussy like he didn't want asked about the interior so that's a man's perspective no disrespect to men but that was yeah, a man's yeah. perspective on it where for me it was like no the girls have got to look like this and have the hair like this because that's how when I was sat in college looking over the road that's how I thought the girls would be I thought they're going to be like you know tiny waist big boobs and they were going to be absolutely stunning and making loads of money so I was like no like you need to be the they need to be the best version of themselves so I was going in and despite going home and having a little cry you know behind closed doors because no one give a fuck so um I go back and still and I, I was developing myself so unknowingly developing myself so much like now for instance it'd be it'd be little things like power struggles so these girls would would stand there and bear in mind they've got their big shoes on and I'm not the tallest girl in the world so they'd be towering over me and I'd be taking the money and I'd be doing this and right your shifts for next week and I would feel myself like off shaking and think like fucking just sort it out Amy because it's like a power struggle if you show that you're intimidated they're going to run rings around you whereas now I'm so ruthless and so caught and I'm so composed. Dominant. Yeah, but I've never, ever to this day, the girls have never heard me shout, even when I'm annoyed with them, I'll go in and speak because I feel like that's a sign of weakness and I, I learned all this, you know, myself. And if a girl, there's ever an issue, say for instance, I have to go and pull a girl. If she comes to me, I'll be like, can you just step back here a little bit in my space? You know, and it's having those boundaries now to demand that respect i respect you i come with good intentions you know you do the same back and we've got a, a good relationship but as i say i learned it all through the girls so how much was it for a dance back then back that back then it Dana, was, 20 quid no it's so i created the 20 pound dance in liverpool mm. so i think it was 20 pound in london at the time when i come into it was a fiver was that it was five pounds of that and this is what i say to the girls when the charge and 40 i get them in the change rooms and i'm like listen I fucking made this, you know, I pushed this up for you. Don't take the piss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a five out of ten. So how so, did it work with them coming in and charging? What percentage do you take? How does it work? So obviously back then, you know, it was all over the place because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Now, um, a lot of clubs, um, so like this, sorry, there was a five pound topless, which I banished and it was ten pound nude. So I created 20 pound nude and I was like, listen, just sell it all you want. You know, it's twenty pound route. It's double the money. Like just whatever. It's four minutes, a bit minute longer. Just um. So I was always looking to push the bar. Um. So a lot of clubs work on like a dollar system. So you would have to go to the bar, buy dollars, go and hand it to the girl. Now to me, there's a thought process, and I think the more difficult, the the more you, the more difficult you make something, the more the less likely you are to do it because you've got to then think, you know what I mean? Rather than have that girl in front of you, you go, oh, I'm one sec, I'm just going to go to the bar and buy those dollars and then I'm going to come back. It's like, you're not going to do it. So I'm quite old school, so rude, still a cash club despite the card. You know, I, I work hard to get around that and make sure that the girls can get cash. And um, I work on a set fee, so it's pretty old school. Most clubs work on a commission basis, which means that they will take a percentage of your earnings. Now, for me personally... I believe that that, um, that that kind of like, what's the word? You're, it, it's like you're almost punished for being a hyena. Now, if you're a hyena, it's because you've invested the most in yourself. You, you know, you're great on stage. You're great with customers. You're good looking. You, you know, you're, you're full of character. You're confident. So, if you're going to be a hyena and they're the girls that I want in the club, so I'm not going to go and take a big massive commission off you when the same girl who's putting no effort in and is sat there, you know, in the corner, adding no value to the floor, 
whatsoever there's nothing about her she's safe because she's going to pay a commission just like you so i have a set face so it's like i say to the girls think of it as like you know you're working on a taxi you can drive around and earn loads of money or you can park up on the rank but you're still going to pay the same fee at the end of the day do you know what i mean um, does that get them to work harder then yeah it does but it also enables me to keep the best girls because they're not being penalized for earning well mm -hmm. so at uh, the way i've set things up now moving to um so it's a level playing field with everyone yeah so yeah. somebody gets one dance or somebody gets 100 dances they're still paying the same yeah yeah they are now obviously i have a program for um for new girls so because roots that's why i have other clubs now as well roots is a, is a daunting club for girls to start at because it's a, you know it's a bit it's now the biggest in the uk the whole club is centered around the stage and i wanted to do that because coming from basically like a tiny little living room with with a curtain i want you know i had all these ideas and back then i had um i had like footballers coming in and wanting to spend money but they needed that privacy and i couldn't offer it because i was just at this little you know tiny room so we ended up setting upstairs up so we had like this little tiny vip floor upstairs and i sat down and this was something that had never been done at the time so i'm going back you know 14 years in i'm like six months in at this time so over 13 years ago when i went into it you just earned money off dancers it was like you you went to strip club you bought your ale and you know in some in some cases the girls would be on commission for the drinks and things but you don't know that you know what i mean so they're like oh let's have a drink whatever then you've got your dancers so as these like bits of like like reserve players were coming in they wanted to spend money i was like how, how do i do this how do I, how can i capitalize on this so I sat down and everything I do is just, it's so, so raw. Everything I do is just like pen and paper. Even now, like my idea of like putting something on the system is writing it down, taking a photograph on my phone. You know, I have everyone up the wall. Uh, I sat down and I was like, wait, book a girl for half an hour, book a girl for an hour. So then I started working these prices out where I would then earn money off it. But then it meant that the girls could earn more money, that I could offer something to these the customers, that they would have this privacy with the girls. And that, the, you know, it would up the girl's income, up my income. So we started doing that. Um, and that went really well. And um, this was the thing. It was all just like stages of me learning, you know, through the girls, how it was going to be. Um, and then, yeah, we got to year seven. Then it was. And the landlord was selling up and I got kicked out. And I was like, I'd always said, I think with Rude for me, it was always like, he was never, I've never had a plan. People say like, what's your goal in five, 10 years? I'm like, I don't fucking know what I'm going to do tomorrow. So like, I'd never taken it seriously. Like when I went into it after having Dolly, I was just like, oh, I'll just do this for a little bit. I'll earn a bit of money and then I'll go back to a normal life that I can speak about and be, you know, um, be, be normal and be able to talk about what i do but i was going through so many struggles and i had nothing but good intentions so i was changing this industry but for the better so i started adding structure to it so i was hated for it at first and it rude to one of those places like it's like mom might you love it or you hate it because you can either be set in your ways of no i, I just want to do what i want on my terms because you are self-employed so this was like a barrier that i had to break when you're saying like, like you're trying to change it for the better because i know a lot of people look at that industry and think people are getting exploited people are getting trafficked like it will be looked down as one mm. of those industries the sector industry is yeah. all the same only fans strippers porn stars prostitutes people will look at it as yeah um, everybody's getting exploited because I know he says men used to exploit them. So what would make you different from not doing the same? Um, because this is the thing. I get all the shit because I'm on the front line. So I'm there. I'm legalised. I, you know, people, I'm easy to attack because I'm there. But what people have to remember is like, there's no sex that goes on because there doesn't need to be. If your, your fella wants to go and get that, he can you know, you've got adult work, like you say, you've got only fans. There's brothels everywhere. You've got massage parlours that we know do far more than massages, but no one speaks about that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, attack the girl who runs a strip club. Now, I didn't create this industry. All I've done is, as a woman, come in and developed it and developed it for the better and took these girls and nurtured them. There's a lot of my job that people don't see. So I've gone from being absolutely petrified, being terrorised by these girls breaking those boundaries understanding their world the issues they've come with seeing what they had to deal with because obviously i'm 
you know, as much as you could go, well, poor me, I'm like going home to this baby and the, these girls are all together and I'm not included. I didn't have to work the floor. They did. They had to deal with the men on the front line. You know, I didn't. So I'm sat in the office and then coming out taking their money. And I remember this one night being upstairs in this new VIP that I've made and this, um, this football team come in. And they were absolute arseholes and they were speaking to the girls like shit and I was behind the bar like filling jugs up and they were shouting over to me and um, nothing horrendous but just being really disrespectful I remember just being like oh my god you know and um, just I looked over at the girls and I think it was the first time I'd been with them in that situation where I was getting it as well. And I seen they were like, they were they had my back, which was the first time I felt part of them. You know, they were like, no, 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 don't speak to her like that. Like she, she's the boss, like leave her alone. You know, because I was like, um, so I remember at the end of the night, like going into the changing rooms, I was like, oh my God, like they were arseholes. And they were just like, oh yeah babe it's fine like don't worry about it and I was like do you get that all the time and they were like yeah that's just how it is and I remember going home that night and thinking like wow like it's fucking it's it's shit you know wonder these women are so hardened because a lot of men even to this day now but the girls are so trained because I I vet them that men still come into strip clubs now as it's especially when you come into Ruth it's an opportunity to see a girl who's like a 10 out of 10 who would never give you you know never give you the time of day in real life and it's like some men get a kick out of speaking to them like shit it's like a power thing you know like a small man thing that they'd be like oh fuck off you slag or whatever and I, we say to the girls that like, you will be treated how you tolerate being treated do you know what i mean so um I say that you still you still you know you get some men who are amazing but you still get those arseholes as well and it's just like you learn to deal with them but um yeah I remember going home like that night and lying in bed thinking like wow fucking hell like you know it, that's just that's horrible so it helped me then to kind of understand them and what they faced and I put more so I put structure in so they had to work set amount of nights they had to be in on time um otherwise you know they you would take like a fee off on top of their fee if they were late and that was to enable me to then start taking bookings and build relationships with customers and know that I was going to be able to provide a service I was not rock up and not know who's going to turn in because it's their birthday and they've all gone out for the night you know what I mean but I had to build a club so I was so hungry so it was like the power is the money I have to have this club has to make the most money that all the girls want to work for me because if my club shit I can't tell you you've got to be in on this night you've got to come in at this time and you've got to book your time off through me you're self-employed so it was this this back to and fro for a couple of years that they couldn't understand because no one had ever shaken the industry in that way they were like well we work for ourselves and I was like that's fine you work for yourselves but these are this is this is the protocol that I expect you to follow if you want to be self-employed in my establishment to make this industry better and it enables them the new girls that come in now and obviously they're all delightful now and they're all a lot younger than me now and it's it's great you know it's super easy for me now because again I'm so grateful that I started and I still speak to some of these girls now on like Instagram and stuff and it's great because you're able to connect with them um what and makes a good stripper um you would think someone who was really good looking like for instance, what a few years ago I had two identical, I had two, well, obviously two. I had identical twins, um, gorgeous little things like platinum blonde, and they come, they'd never danced before, and I was like, I thought I'd won the lottery, James. I was like, wow. So I was training them, and I was like, oh, these men are gonna think like all the Christmases have come at once, and I was like, you know, imagine, you know. So I was like, right, put your matching underwear, because obviously the more they in, the more I in, because I've set it up this way yeah, now. It's a business. Yeah. So I'm like this is what we do. So you're going to be in this underwear because I'm really, again, I'm really strict over. They have to wear certain shoes. The hair has to be out because this is what, like, I knew just when, when, I, when I started in this industry is how scruffy the girls was. You know, they'd come in with their hair lashed up and I'm like, are we coming to work or are we cleaning the toilets? You know, so I'd piss a lot of people off because I had to be really straight. But I'd learn from the, these, the toughest girls that you've just got to fucking, it's my club. You've got it it's for your own interest you know what I mean you're not going to walk into a strip club if a girl's got mismatched underwear and shit shoes and her hair lashed up and go woof I want to give her all my money are you it's like if you come in it's like it's almost like a uniform you know but I do the same so I make sure when I'm on the floor my hair's done you know I look 
I look my best, so I'm not going to go around and tell you that you need to tidy up your appearance if I don't, you know, I don't, so it's like I practice what I preach, you know. Um, so yeah, these girls, I was like, right, match your underwear, like work together, because girls can do that, you know, double dance. And I'm like, I'm acting out scenes in the changing rooms. I'm like, the guys at the bar, you come one side, you come the other side, like, oh my God, you're going to smash it. Didn't get it. They, they did not get it. They ended up going online. And that's the thing. A lot of girls can do really well online, but not so much in a strip club and, you know, the other way around. So um, I'd get on the floor and one would be sat over there and the other one would be, I'd be like, where's your sister? And she's like, oh, she's doing a dance. I'd be like, why aren't you with her? Like, what, what are you doing? And I'd get a sister and I'd be like, girls just need to work together. Like, you've got something so unique. You can earn so much money, but some girls just, just don't get it. And... Even to this day, it's like I don't invest too much time on auditions anymore because the likelihood of girls even turning up, and, it, you know, I get it, it's a daunting thing. Um, so we get a lot of girls apply. We get a lot of girls come in pissed and say they want to be strippers, and I'm like, just call the club tomorrow when you're sober. Um, but you get a lot of girls apply, and then we'll filter through them and invite certain girls in, and then even then, one in ten will turn up, you know. Who's the oldest that's ever what? The oldest at the moment is 47. And she smashes it because... People love an older bird. They do. Fat birds, they do. Skinny. People they do. are they do. glassy. No, honestly, People, everybody's you've got, different. You've got everybody's got weird different fetishes. Everybody's, yeah, you've got to be versatile because you've all weird, just got the fucking yeah. five feet ten blondes with the big tits. It's, you know what I'm saying? It, yeah, it doesn't yeah. work. You've got to mix it up. Yeah, yeah, women yeah. As well. Like it's all, you no, know, the boobs are also fashion at the moment, as I know. Um, yeah, she's 47 and she smashes it because she treats the men like they are a king. And I don't think you get that from a younger girl. It's mass manipulation. When yeah, I used to go to strip clubs, yeah. I never used to get dances. I used to do shit with the champagne, get on the fucking gear, man, and thought it was a baller. But all my friends, they used to fall in love with the girls, yeah, but I used do. to see the way they worked, the way they, they touched their ears and their neck, and they used to think, yeah, oh, they love yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the silly <laughs> bastards were back every night just milking them for their money. Yeah. But fair play, as a business, yeah. as a business, and I would never shut it down because, like I say, I've got people who are strippers, porn stars, only fans, male and female. That's down to them. That's their life. That's yeah. their choices. But if people are forcing them to date, then I've got an issue. But if everybody's got choices, different levels of pain, different levels of trauma. I know people who's been in that industry, it's also come out and done amazing with their life. I know people yeah. are stuck in the industry though, and the more they do it, I do see the more damage that mm -hmm. happens within their eyes or their soul or whatever it is. Yeah. They do struggle more where they're just constantly chasing that. And like you say, it's accepting that abuse and getting fucking their boyfriends are pumping them out to go there to make money and they're taking all the money. Like, if it's for your own choice and you're doing it just to get through life, there's yeah. nothing. I, I don't see it. I wouldn't want my daughter doing it. Mm. I wouldn't want my daughter doing OnlyFans, but if some girl wants to get their tits out and make some extra cash, by all means, do what the fuck you've got yeah, to do because yeah. men are stupid enough to pay for it. And I see a lot of men. In the comments, you'll see it's all men who hate porn stars, OnlyFans girls. It's these perverts that are paying for it. Of course, they it's, it's about Yeah, they were about a business if they weren't paying thing, for yeah. it. And the ones who are giving the hate, I'm telling you, they'll be subscribing to five, six, seven, eight different girls because mm. they're just trying to portray it as if, oh, I, I don't care, that's disgusting. You're paying for it, you're yeah. dirty bastard. Like, I don't understand the only fans, but I know people that do it and they say, like, people subscribe to give them shit, you yeah. know? But most of my shit comes from, from men, like, insecure, unhappy men. But I just laugh at them like it's because I've got more money and more pussy than they'll ever have, you know what I mean? Like, I'm the bad <laughs> yeah. So, they get an older woman, what's that? Yeah, yeah, so she does really well because she, and this is the thing, is it's not, as I say, going back to the, the twin sisters, they went on to OnlyFans, they do great on OnlyFans. Um, it's, it's not so much how you look. I think initially, you know, men are are attracted of you know visually to women so they'll like what they see but then it's like a lot of it as well if you've got a stunning girl you know men still feel a little bit threatened so i i remember going to a club in london because i love to go to strip clubs to to the ones that i'm allowed in that i'm not like recognized and they don't let me in but um why are you not allowed in other strip because clubs because you know who i am so do you know, like, and I'm not poaching girls. I would never do that. I don't need any girls. I've got, I've got loads of girls. Um, but I think they just like, fuck, you know, letting it in, and that's fine. Um, if to be fair, if I knew someone was a strip club, then I probably wouldn't let them in either. So it's, you know, but is that because they do poach girls? Or listen, if yeah, I had yeah. a restaurant or a club, I would be doing the rounds to see what works. 
yeah, the decor, yeah. how it functions, exactly, the staff, that's it. And how that's the security, why, yeah. what they wear. I would be picking up on everything. Yeah, and that's what I do. Like I'll go into to clubs and that, and I'm just like I'm looking to see exactly exactly what you've just said. What are they doing? I, I need to check that I'm still the best and I'm still the biggest. That you know I've got the best girls, that the best service. That I'm constantly looking like I'm still where I've spent this year now working on my business rather than so much in my business because I think that's important you can get so consumed with running your business What's the that, so working on the business so to develop it so now um going through so many struggles like mentally and being consumed by this industry and going through COVID and losing everything and coming back because I almost feel like Rude's gone through two phases and moving from a small building to now the biggest in the UK it was like I've gone through a lot that I was like, no, actually, I need to now, you know, times at times are pretty shit at the moment. Everyone's struggling. So it was like, I need to level up again. I'm always looking for what can I do more. So now it's about concentrating on me and developing me as a person and developing my business. So adding, you know, experiences and making things more vem- uh, more memorable and immersive. So now you walk in and there's like, um, I have videos playing all over the club so it's like girls doing strip teasers getting naked so that you've got when you walk in Rude's like because I want to take always take it to the next level and be different so it's centered around the stage so when you walk in there's like fire shows going on there's girls so I opened um, my own pole studio a year ago called Rude Girl Studio so that's within the vicinity of the building because it's so big so I was lucky enough to be able to do that so you you can gain access through the club so the girls can come and then come straight into the club to work but you can also it's like the other the back on um, Henry Street so customers normal girls or men we have to be diverse don't we um, can can go to the pole studio so they can interact with with you know some of the real girls because i like to push real girls up as almost like you are at your pinnacle of your dancing career like we they're like local celebrities if you're a real girl um so it's a it's a place where they can train because i want my girls to be the best so that's something that I offer them because, you know, pole fitness is huge at the moment as well. You know, so many people go, not just strippers, they go to it, don't they, for all, you know, fitness and what whatnot. So, um, yeah, I opened this studio so that all the girls get like free memberships and they can go and they can train because it's important for me that when you come into Rude, you're going to walk down those stairs and you're going to see a girl on stage performing. You're going to see fire shows and then the screens of the girls who work there. So it's a great way for them, obviously, to promote themselves. But they're, you know, stripping off and getting naked on screen. It's all about me. This is what I've learned through the girls, but I've also had to learn through the customers as well as... And I, I learned, like, with with men, that it's like they have this, like... Obviously, they, they have a sexual desire, but they also have, like, this desire to feel important and feel great. So it's, it's like, tapping into that. So for me, Rude's, like, a collaboration of those two things. You know, how can... If men come in, how can I make them feel... Like they're a king for the night. How do we do that? So, um, upstairs we have the I have the stage, and then upstairs when I was building this club, um, I was like, well, all the upstairs is going to be like VIP booths, and there's a bar up there, and the seat, and we I charge a lot of money for people to go up there, but they will because they want to be seen. You know, they want to be seen with loads of girls, and they've got like a full view of the stage, and they just like I think. It baffles me, I'll be honest. It baffles me. You go home, you've got nothing to show for it. But you felt great at the time. So, you know, life's short, whatever. But whatever makes, you know. How many girls you got working for you? Um, So in Rude, there's about, it varies. So I have to balance, you know, the shifts. So obviously like Friday, Saturday, you've got your full squad in. Unless, you know, girls are booked off. And then we're open five, sometimes six nights a week, depending on football. So um, then those girls, I will like kind of, balance them out so they, they don't have to work five nights but there's enough girls to cover the floor that it's not so busy you don't want to flood the floor and the girls don't earn money but um having enough girls that if, when the customers come in that you know the it, the customers are happy there's enough girls it's a big club there's enough girls to work the floor so on average it's about 40 so this is why it was important for me that i needed to add that structure in to an you know otherwise rude would not have been able to sustain itself it would not be the biggest in the uk it would not be the best it would not have the best scales had i not put all this stuff you know in place what makes it the biggest in the uk um so it's the biggest in terms of size 
and I've been the first to do everything. So the biggest turning point with Rude was when I moved. So I got kicked out by the landlord. I had no home for the club. And the club over the road um, was for sale. And it was huge. And um, it was it was my husband, Carl, who was like, we, that's where we need to go. And I'll be honest, I was like, nah. like when Because when, we come from a club that was so small. I was like, we're never... We, we can't fill that club like it's it's massive it's 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 huge and we went in and i've got pictures and it was just like the the previous tenants had ripped everything out and anyway we did it and it was like you know oh my god it was way over like a million pounds like ridiculous amounts of money and i remember going and like trying to get these loans and get this mortgage and stuff and i was still only really young and uh, to the point where at this point I, I didn't give a fuck you know um everyone knew what i was doing i was act i was there proud of what i was doing it, it shaped me as a person i was thinking i do so fucking much for these girls like uh what you know i was like i'm just this is it this is me i'm just gonna go all in and i remember because it was such a big purchase getting sent like by the solicitor to like a financial advisor and he sat me down and i had i, th I think it was my youngest daughter i always seem to just have a baby just pouncing around with me. <laughs> um and I, and I sat down and he was like do do you understand like what you're about to do like you're about to take on this this club like you sign an ear like a million pound deal for this and that and I was just like yeah because at that point I was just like what's the worst that can happen like it would die like you know so what um so I did went in and again like I wasn't at this point I wasn't a millionaire I'd come from a small club so my earnings were I had so many ideas so much stuff I wanted to do but I was so limited because I had this tiny club so um this was now like this was so I'm going back now this was 2016 so this was like this was like the re this was rude this was like everything I had seven years experience there was no excuses now everything I wanted to do I was able to do there was no holding back like it was fucking it was real um but I had a certain amount of money so I had to do it as I want so I had all these ideas like this the chain the toilet sorry in this club at the time was huge and I remember I spent my 18th birthday in there and all the get all the girls from Liverpool would all be in there. It was like it must have been about 30 toilets. So everyone had spent the night in there. So I was like, those toilets are iconic, they're iconic in Liverpool. And that's like a real Liverpool culture, is that, you know, girls, a little bit like the Scottish girls, they're the same when they come to Rude. They're all in there snotting yeah. gear. That's why the toilets are so fucking <laughs> busy. They all love me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. They're in there snotting the panning. But I was like, those toilets need to be the girls' changing rooms. I want to make this huge complex. But obviously, I needed the bar, I needed the pole, I needed all the important stuff. So it, again, it was a process. So it was almost like, which I think is really important, I was starting from brand new again. And every time, you know, I went through COVID, when I've opened another club and I've just recently opened a third club, it knocks you back down, James, because you go from being the best to starting again. So it keeps you grounded and keeps you humble. You know what I mean? That's perfect so, for you. Yeah, yeah. So there's no ego with me with money. Do you know what I mean? I've got no ego because it's just like, if I don't do this, I can't, there's no food on the table. So I'll do what, you know, whatever. So I went back to like, basically square one um i opened this club um and i had to do it i had to do it all on my own so it was like pretty shitty times um the husband was away in germany his mum was terminal and he was caring for her so i had like two two babies i had two so sort of four daughters um which again i don't think i'd have been able to do in a normal job you know what i mean i wouldn't have had that freedom to be able to work as i'm I wouldn't say as and when I wanted because I was totally consumed, but have that freedom to be be there when I needed to be there maybe and take them along with me. My mum was still working at this point. I wasn't like wealthy enough to take her out of work and do all the things that I'd said I was, 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 you know, that I wanted to do. So I had to do it myself and it was a case of just getting up and getting on with it. I went missing, literally went missing for like two years. I didn't speak to anyone. Um, I had to get this club open and I remember just like standing at a huge balcony which is now the VIP floor and stood over and we were building this stage and I had this like vision in my head but I was just terrified thinking like what the fuck like how am I going to make this work how am I going to get the girls how am I going to I just thought like it, you know when Carl was away I was on my own and I, I'd done it all and I, I, I laugh now to say to the girls like hey, all these change rooms I've changed the nappy and every all these damn VIP boots sorry I've changed the nappy and every single one of them that's how raw it was you know every 
every part of that club is me. You know what I mean? I am rude is me. Like you cut me in half. It's just like that. It the everything about that club it is me. I designed every single part of it. I've worked every part of it. So again, I opened and um. I'd like run around, they had all flowers for the girls, presents, everything, because I was just like, I was making, I was turning it round. Now these girls love me and I love them. And I had friends because I'd moved. I had this baby. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anyone in my area. I'd not, I lived, I worked in this nocturnal world that was crazy, that no one understood. And it got to a point, James, where I didn't want to speak to people because then it's the question, not that I was embarrassed because I, I got to a point where I was proud because I was doing so much. When does that change from being embarrassed? And I think when I moved to, to I think when proud. I moved to the big, the big club and shit got serious. And I think the like, money comes in as well. You don't give a fuck. You yeah, think it yeah, gives a that's fuck. what I mean. I, yeah, I was money like, comes, I, you, no matter what you're doing, if you've got money, you genuinely don't give a fuck. Well, this is it. So you're it. starting off, you're kind of sheepish and worried what to say, this and that. But then you do get a bit of money and you think, fuck well, off. Well, this is the thing. I was earning crazy money that I thought, if I don't tell people what I do, they're just going to assume I'm selling drugs because there's no other way I could be earning this amount of money. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it was that. It was it. Going to the big club, and um, I think knowing how much good because I've only ever I only ever had good intentions, you know what I mean. And it's like a lot of these girls come into this this industry who are now you know a lot younger. The students they're they're away from home. Their mums might not know they dance. I've got a juicy care to look after them. They're, when they're in that club, they're my responsibility. So there's a lot that people don't see. When they're upset, it's me that sat there. When they've come back from my beef, it's me that's going and getting them a pregnancy test. It's all that shit that I hope that someone would do for one of my daughters if you 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 know you wasn't there to do it yourself. Tell me, that's so what you want. Would you want one of your daughters being a stripper? Oh, see, I feel like when people listen to this, I'm obliged to say I wouldn't mind, but obviously, no, I wouldn't like that. You know, no. Yeah, and you know, I'd be honest, yeah. Um, I wouldn't want my daughter to no. do that. No, yeah, I wouldn't like them to be. Um, but having said that, it's like I go places now. Like, I go, I've been away, say, like with Hannah, and we'll meet people. And I remember we were we were in Name of Villa one time, and there was this girl there, and she, a mum come was with her, and her mum was boss, Welsh woman, she was brilliant, proper girl's girl, and she was sat with us. And I said to Hannah, we got back to the room, and I was like, she used to be his answer. And Hannah was like, how oh, do you know? I was like, I can tell. They've got this like persona about them because you are a saleswoman, but you learn so much about men. You learn the power of manipulation. And no matter what you do in life, it's a great skill to have because so many girls be the cleverest girl in the world, but they're fucking stupid when it comes to men. And like, as much as we can say women are manipulative, men can be shits and, you know, they, they, they know how to play a girl. And it's like, it's all about the chase and things. And I think doing my job you get to see both sides and understand both sexes and how different they are and when you you kind of like you understand the game and you know what it is you're so much more confident like i'm more confident with men like a lot of the men in work we like, run six venues now and they're all like amy's petrified amy's petrified like i'm terrified of it and i'm like why i never i never show it at anyone i'm not but it's because i just i don't know it's that like that so that just how I am. As I don't a know. Your energy can when you come into a sense of power, you feel power. And yeah, you feel yeah. powerful. People notice that. People notice calm, people notice confidence, people notice people who are scared. We all know. But yeah. if you see somebody of power walking in a room, you know, oh, wait a minute, he's got something. You just know who to respect. You kinda of, I respect everybody, but you know there's certain things you can say to yeah, different yeah. people. What's the rules of the club? Um so the rules are um, so there's the obvious, you know, you you have to turn in for your shifts, otherwise you, you still owe the fee, um, you get charge fees if you're late. So the rules are no touching. Um, that's not set by me, that's set by, you know, it's like the council. Um, so no touching, 12 inches, but then, you know, you can you can get around those rules, you know what I mean? So you can like, you can be with a distance, but so when you say no touching, just no touching in certain areas, shall we say. But one of the reasons I'm big on that, as I say to girls, because it's, you've got to keep it fair. So this is what, these are all the rules that I had in place that I got a little bit of shift for. And I was like, girls, I do this for you. I do this to protect you because I'm responsible for you while you're here. So 
say for instance you were to get a dance and a girl starts touching you well then she's inviting you to touch her but then if you touch her she's gonna go and cry and it's like well you touched him do you see what i mean so it's like to protect yourself don't touch them because he's a man at the end of the day you know and he's going to get aroused getting this dance or whatever so you're going to touch that guy you're then inviting him to touch you and then you're going to get upset and then we need to come in and you know um protect you so there's the touching rule is in place and there's a lot of rules within a strip club and this is what like annoys me to be honest when people think that i think they would be really i think they'd be really shocked when they come in and seeing that it's so light-hearted do you know what I mean? Like the stage shows are amazing. They are sexualized. There's a lot that goes on. Um, but in terms of rules, you know, there's there's it's it's it is it's really strict, you know, in terms of but there's that respect there. And I think most men they find they get it. Um but yeah, that's it really. And then there's just like my rules, you know, so how you perceive yourself. So you, I, I vet the girls before they start. So it's like, I get, I feel like you get a good vibe for someone's energy. Do you know what I mean? So you get on straight away if a girl's gonna, because we're a nice bunch of girls. We've all got each other's back. We're all in the changing rooms. We are absolute, like, it's like when you see us in the changing rooms, we're the most unsexiest things ever. You know what I mean? They've all got the onesies on and the cups of tea and we're cuddled up. And it's like, it's lovely. And I, I love it because I am in this, world with these amazing girls and I've finally been accepted and because I've come so far from that old group of girls that these girls don't know any different that I'm you know I'm respected but they also know that I'm there for them and I'll do anything for them um and it's still difficult you know don't get me wrong like these, these girls will leave sometimes and they'll still shit on you and there's still that you know the boss the worker mentality where they'll be friends with those girls and they won't speak to you or they'll turn a bit nasty out of jealousy or whatever and it's one of them you just have to learn that it's not personal i just accept it um you what know is still it down, what is the downfalls of that job what is what? the downside of being the boss of strippers to then the downside of actually being a stripper the negatives that come with it um so the negatives that come what with for being a dancer yeah um but there's a lot like it's not an easy job people think that you know you earn like an exceptional amount of money and and you know and you can but it comes with experience as well so it's not guaranteed so you could go and work a 10 hour shift and work on your feet all night long and not earn a penny because you've had a shit night you know you could have a shit week and this is people think like people message me and go how much money am i going to earn and i'm like i can't answer that question i can't even tell you how the night's going to be do you know what I mean? You could go, you could go in on a Saturday night and it's shit. You could miss the Sunday because you're knackered and a load of guys have come in and spent thousands of pounds upstairs. You know, it you've gotta be be strong and be willing and be determined and accept that you're not always gonna earn money. Some nights you're gonna do well, some nights you're gonna be in debt to the club that you, you work at. You're also going to have to deal with a lot of shit because as I said before, there is still those narcissistic men that are gonna come in and, you know you've got to be really, really strong. And that's why, like, I, I take it really serious in terms of what girls I take on. And sometimes a girl might not get past, not because she's not beautiful or I think she's good, but I just think she's a little bit too young or a little bit, you know, she's she's not ready. And I wouldn't feel comfortable with putting a girl on the floor that's not able to take the flack that you're going to get because it's not all rosy. You know, these guys that are going to come and buy your presents throw money at you you know you do get a lot like even i get it you know you get men telling you you know like the the you get you desire by men every single weekend to the point where it's quite funny because like the girls will talk and they'll be like guys will try and speak to them when they're out you know just at a petrol station just dead innocently and they're like for free you know like because they just like in the head they're like everyone just loves you you know and then but it's difficult it comes with a lot of issues like a lot of dancers end up being lesbians because you're just like so traumatized by men and all the shit that you get with them and obviously you're in these changing rooms there's all these women and you you're in this like nocturnal world that no one else understands and i know for me personally like now i speak openly about it because there's been like the tv show there's been so much press around it that i speak about it and people read about it and i get that it's interesting but people don't understand it so sometimes you feel like public property because if i was to go to i don't know a party and someone goes hey do you know what she does that's it then james it's an interview do you know what i mean everyone wants to ask me questions and i'm like fuck off like i'm not in work i just want to so we tend to just 
I can say we because I'm part of that gang now. But we just, we tend to just kind of keep yourself to yourself. So your friends, like I know my friends now are, are, are strippers. We, we all hang around together because it's just, it's easier because we all understand each other's lives and we're all supportive of, of each other. Why is it so important for you to be accepted? Um, because I'm not, I'm n I was initially, but I'm not here. I'm no longer here for the money. I'm here to develop this industry and to make a change. I've got enough money. I've got everything that I could ever want. Um, money doesn't excite me anymore i've got my big house i've got my cars the kids have got what they want i've got all my animals i've got my mum out of work like i'm not here for money as long as i can pay my bills i'm here to make a change so personally that's like you know me with the cats because obviously outside of this strip club where i live this like i'm in this sexy world i go home and i'm in my fluffy house coat like you know scooping cat shit so it's like you know because they don't give a fuck <laughs> Um, but it was really, it was always really important for me to be accepted because without the girls, James, there is no club. So I had to get those girls on side. So when going back to it, when I moved to the big club and I done, you know, all the obvious things. And then I was like, right, I want to have the VIP. I decided because it was, the girls were, it was notoriously known that the girls get changed in the toilets. So even in some of the biggest clubs, like the the changing rooms are just like those terracotta tiled toilets, you know, the shittles, because that's back a house. No one sees that. You know, you, you know yourself, you go in a nightclub and you know, you you know the promoter, you go in the office, it's always a shithole. So that's where the girls were always changed. Now for me, I notice everything. My mind's always going ten to the dozen. So if I go to a restaurant and the toilets are dirty, then I'm like, what's the kitchen look like? You know, if the cutlery is a little bit dirty, I'm like, oh, I don't want to eat here. Like so for me, I was like, you are, you know, your workplace, your mindset, and this is a difficult job. And I was seeing so many girls in vulnerable situations from abusive relationships to unwanted pregnancies to miscarriages to abortions. I've been there through it all and, and still got shit for it as well from people. And I'm like, you couldn't take me away, put me in a box. What's going to happen? You're just going to have a man come and carry on exploiting this industry. Like, wouldn't you rather a woman was in control of it? Do you know what I mean? So um, I made the decision once the club had been open for a few months that I was going to go back to those huge girls' toilets that were had been all sectioned off and were now in use for different things. And I was like, nah, I'm going to knock through it all and I'm going to have got an interior designer in. And I spent a lot of, a lot of money. Um, I think I spent about 100 grand on turning these, these rooms into this amazing space just for the girls so it was the most beautiful part of the club so there's you know sofas in there um this big dressing room makeup room so they've got you know all the mirror the hollywood mirrors beautiful toilets wallpapered ceilings baby gold you know everything's like gold it's like it is like the barbie dream house do you know what i mean and i was inspired by like victoria secrets because i always say like what you know you look at your business and give it an identity and for me Rue, Rube was like the Victoria's Secrets of strip clubs you know what I mean it's sexy but it's still classy it's beautiful you know so um how do you look at men now oh it's difficult see someone like you who's super confident and like I, I've got a lot of respect for but it's quite difficult and I'm I'm so glad that like I'm not having to go out and find a man now because with a lot of girls and say like the they end up becoming lesbians i think that you you see men in their most vulnerable at their most vulnerable state do you know what i mean and it's like the power of the pussy isn't it so it's really in some cases you just and i think that's why i'm so ruthless with men compared to girls because all the girls like we've i've got a huge team now and there's loads of girls working in the office and i'm lovely with them but unknowingly i'm probably not as i'm a bit more straight with men because i'm i see myself as one of them and i see the girls as like oh i'm like I'm like the top G and I have to look after the girls but when I sit in the room with the men like even the doorman I'll run the meeting do you know what I mean and I think some men struggle with that um but yeah I, I, a lot of us like you, you do struggle to have the same respect for men when you see to, not not respect but to take men seriously when you yes, know you do yeah, but, but then you know, again, you need them to. But like, because I've got businessmen that are coming in and wanting to, you know, like pay hundreds of pounds to just get stood on, but then he's going into the office 
as as a professional man so it's just like you see all these things that you know normal people don't see so I think it's great because I, nothing nothing phases me I can be quite ballsy with men and just be like what's this what's that and like to ever I see men a bit like but it's just because I just don't really take them seriously as the same way I would with with women <laughs> Sorry. Well, see the bastards, but that's why the, the sex industry is so big. But, yeah. but again, a lot of men, a lot of men do struggle, mm. and like one third the men are virgins, and I feel as if everybody yeah. in life always wants a partner. We don't matter what we do, everything we do, people go to the gym, people try and be successful, get some status, so they can attract a partner. Of course, people post on Instagram or whatever it is to get that attention. And to I think try and you've find got a partner. To, you've got to be compassionate. Like as I say, I'm not driven by by money and shit. So like, the certain times like when customers come in and they're fucking adorable, and I'm just like, nah, girls don't like you know because you say like they're lonely or they're going through a divorce or whatever, and it's like they're the men that get exploited online. Do you know what I mean? Because there's no face to it. The girl's just there, just like... And I hear stories, like, they're paying. Like, I was speaking to one girl the other day who does a bit of, you know, online on the side from work and rude, and I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Like, they, they will chill, set a vibrator up, and, and they pay. And I'm like, how does that work? Like, it's all run through Bluetooth, and they'll pay for that to yeah. go off. And she's like, but I just go asleep, and it's wrapped up in a towel, and if I'm awake, I'll just make a noise. And I'm like, well... So they'll 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 pay to to set that off, but she's wrapped it up in a towel and it's at the end of the bed and it's not even touching her. Because I'm like, how do you go asleep if that's in and she's like, Oh no, I've wrapped it up in a towel and it's over there and then and I'm like, the silly bastards. But then there's a part of me that thinks that's that's a little bit harsh, you know what I mean? It's a bit where at least like and I think this is the the damaging thing with online is that we're encouraging we we're already, you know strip clubs as long as you know the game you know what it is and don't get me wrong some customers have taken girls and, and saved them and done whatever and they've become their girlfriends and i know a lot of people who've gone in as customers and bearded them up and they live happily ever after um it can happen you know there's hope <laughs> some of them really do fall in love <laughs> but um the i think the majority of them as long as i remember actually doing a, a, a script with a comedian on strippers and he was coming to do a show and i wrote the script for him and we sat and played it out and i told him exactly what the man says what the and he was like you're a crafty fuckers and i was like yeah but as long as you know what it is what is the tricks of the trade the tricks of the trade so it's it's showing an interest so once the guy comes to the bar so i have a rule that i've learned through going to other clubs I have a rule that the girl cannot approach the guy because I stand, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I stand behind the bar where the stairs are. So the guys come down, I can see the men coming in. I've got the cameras there, I'm all set up. So because I like to be watching everything, but I also like to be on the floor so I can get a feel for what's going on. The guys come in and you've got, obviously it's a huge club, you've got this stage, the girls are there. A lot of men, I would say at least 50% of the time, turn around and go to the toilet. The toilets are just there. Now, I don't believe every man that comes in needs a wee. I think they just get shit themselves a little bit, run the toilet, compose themselves and come in. So I decided to make this rule that none of the girls could approach the men until he's bought a drink. And that's not me trying to push the bar sales. That's just me wanting a man to come in and be able to just be composed a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, take a moment, take it all in, let him get a drink, so, and it also makes the girls look less beggy and I have these rules so that it's a bit of a fair level playing field going back to like the rules in terms of touching that's one of the reasons why the rules are there to protect the girls but also if one girl comes in and, and lets you touch your boobs then she's all the fellas are going to go to her aren't they do you know what I mean because you're going to be like where it gets around I'll go with that one because you can grab her tits but she's fucking, she's a miserable bitch you know she won't let you do nothing so like that's that's the reason, one of the reasons, should I say, that that rules, that I put that rule in place. And it's the same with like not being able to approach a customer until he's he's bought a drink. It means that the girls aren't all going to jump up. It stops some clubs you go to, James. You walk down the stairs and the girls are at the stairs and that's so they can grab you as soon as you walk in. Now that's creating arguments in the changing rooms. But it's also going to make you think like, oh, fuck this, I'm getting off. These girls are too much. And you actually like, it's like going into a shop. If someone stands over me, I'm getting off. But if you leave me to browse at my own leisure, I'm more likely to buy something. So I always try and look at it from a customer's perspective. So, um, yeah, they'll come in, they'll get the drink. And then it's about taking an interest because I, I personally believe anyway that 
you whether you even if you're married if you've been married for for years like sometimes like you're just like oh fuck off you know what i mean life's hard life shit at sometimes it's so predictable it's boring you know these girls are going to come over what's your name where have you been what you do men love that someone's paying them some attention you know yeah it's all a game but they're sitting down with them they're going to have a drink with them and have that chat and it's about having i have to I have to train the girls to have that cut-off point as well because obviously men are going to sit there and talk all night for free. But you don't want to be rude and upset them. So you have that bit of a chat and then it's like, oh, babe, you know, so they might like put their hand on your shoulder or the back of your neck and shall we go for a dance? And if you go, no. Or some guys, which is, you know, it's fair play, are just dead straight and go, you're not my type. Like, they're not going to waste your time. The girls will go, okay, that's fine. You know, and I say to the girls, I could like cheeky bass them. Like, but you know what? He didn't waste 10 minutes of your time, did he? You know what I mean? He likes black girls and you're, you're pale as fuck. So you've moved on. You know what I mean? He's, he's he, and I think, I, I think that's great. Just be honest. And then, and then a lot of the times they'll go over to such a girl and go, he wants a girl with dark hair or he wants a girl with a big ass or whatever um but yeah if the guy is just like do you know what i will in a minute it's just like okay will you enjoy your night i'll catch me later i'll be over there if you want me move on to the next it's about do you know what i mean like having that cut off point but being polite with it as well yeah so you've got all the clubs you're doing everything well you like to be hands-on yeah, with yeah. everything why do the the reality stuff the tv stuff because how else am I getting all the girls from Scotland? It's just business. <laughs> it's just business, yeah. It's just like, um, <clears throat> it was something I think I thought I always wanted to do. So I don't, I didn't realise, to be honest, James, how um, relentless it was, how how time consuming it was. So for some weird reason, I don't know why, I, I don't understand the TV well, but it was about two years ago. We, I literally had about 12 production companies. Someone must have put it out there that they wanted something of that nature. And I had about 12 production companies all come to me wanting something. Um, so I thought the right thing to do was just take everyone up on it. Do you know what I mean? And I was getting recognised because I had so much press. So my first, um, my first national press come from the changing rooms. So going back to that in terms of like doing that whole back of house and investing so much money. And I remember even my dad saying to me like, what the fuck are you doing? Are you mad? Like you're making all this money. What Anyway, the club's great. Why are you going to go and spend all this money on something that people aren't going to see? And I was like, no, dad, this is going to be the making of the club. It's already the biggest. I knew it was the biggest, but no one give a shit. There's loads of clubs all around the country. So it's like, for me, I was like, I'm preaching to these girls, like, you're a real girl, you know, we do it this way, I'm this female boss. No one else knows that, only the people in the club. So I was like, how can I make this club iconic? How can I make everyone in the country know about this club? I had to do something different, so I had to put my money where my mouth was and get this interior designer in and make this amazing workspace with absolutely everything that they could possibly want, so it's beautiful. But as well as given them you know when i had this grand opening and stuff and so they come in now they've got you know all these makeup chairs and mirrors and their own toilets and it's all gorgeous and they can sit they've got these sofas and but it's also full of neon lights with rude all over every mirror's got rude on it's iconic it's the rude colors so it, it's pop pink and black so it's like feminine and masculine energy combined together so that's what describes me um by doing that, it's like, you know, these girls on Instagram, they can't resist the picture when aesthetically the background's beautiful. The first thing they do is take a picture. Mm -hmm. So I done that, James. That was the that was my first big press article. That was the first thing that brought rude loads of attention because it had never been done before. So then all these girls are posting online all over Instagram. Now, they were still, they're still a stripper. They were still a stripper before, but because they've got this gorgeous workplace, they want to show it off. It's changing that mentality. So they then become proud because it was so glamorous and gorgeous that I've marketed it. Like, if you're a rude girl, you're 10 out of 10. Like, there's certain standards you need to acquire to to be able to become a rude girl. So that made them proud. Like, we get we get to be here in this gorgeous club so james i was flooded it went all over the press i was flooded with girls wanting to work i'm getting the highest caliber of girls because they want to be in this beautiful club and they're like wow no one's ever done this before no one's ever invested so much but in turn as i say i'm getting all this like 
publicity because everyone's posting all over Instagram, so everyone's seeing it. So I think that's how then it, I got the press. So then when the TV stuff popped up, it was always me because it's always me that's in, in the press. And then I was the one that was like the naughty one that opened during COVID when... But I was at a point with you, like we were talking about earlier, where I was just like, well, if I lose the club now, like if I lose my license, I'm with an ass, I'll just sell the fucking building. And like, you know, because no one was coming to save me. I was 12 months in, I was closed. All these girls were going online. It was like, uh, what am I going to do? You know, so I, I opened the club in COVID. So I was always like that ballsy one that was doing all the stuff that I shouldn't be doing. And, you know, I was getting a lot of respect for the girls for it as well, because I was bringing them back into work when other clubs wasn't. But I was lucky that I had a huge space, so I was able to still do it and not break any rules. You know, I was I literally went to a company, just hired a shitload of plastic tables and thrown them everywhere. And I was like, every time the police had come in, I was like, the customers are sat down there, waitresses. You know, so they, they couldn't do nothing because I wasn't really. But again, it was in the press and then I was getting shit like you do and all that. People are dying and you're opening your club. And um, so, yeah, I think naturally when they were looking for shows, they would just come to me. And the way I see it, James, is well, if I don't fucking do it, someone else will. And it's like if another strip club owner was here now and I watched it, I'd be like, oh, bastard, why, why, I should have been on that. You know what I mean? So that was always my attitude is it's great for the club people are going to see it people are going to, and I do I get a lot of like a lot of girls from it I get a lot of customers on Saturday like I was on stage collecting dollars for the girls um because as much as I don't have a dollar system in terms of you know you pay with cash you pay on cards like you can fucking pay anywhere you want you can bank transfer me PayPal me don't care paying your is like money's money but um I have like I have like a real currency for the girls on stage so that's just like you can go and a lot of women buy that because it's not as I learned that actually through COVID, it's not as daunting, shall we say, as going and getting a dance. So say you were there with a group of guys, but you're like, some fellas are married and they're just absolute mings and don't want to go and get a dance. So it's like, well, go and get 20 quid worth of dollars and just throw them on the stage to the bed. Like it's not, it's just a bit of fun, isn't it? And it's interactive. It makes the shows fun because the girls are going to come over and stick those dollars in places that they shouldn't and play up and come and tease. And so it puts on a great show for everyone else. And um, yeah, sorry, I'm doing that. And then there's like guys like, oh my God, you're that girl off the off the telly. Um, so unknowingly, it brings customers in as well. But then, so it was great, you know, and it was a great opportunity and I'm so, um, I'm so grateful for it. But it... it Again, that comes with a lot of shit as well, doesn't it? What shit do you get? Just, I think, you know what? Just like, I think jealousy. I got a lot of trolling off that. Um, and again, now, like, I look back and it was quite recent. It was only about a year ago. I look back and I'm grateful for that as well. Um, I think you know who your friends are. Like, don't fuck with a scouse bear because, you know, <laughs> oh my God. Everybody knows I love yeah. the scousers, but you yeah. are tapped. Yeah. But, you but know same what? as the glass regions and that, like, <laughs> you are tapped. The same yeah. as, like, I love the travellers. The community, I was at the Tyson Fury fight and it was all the travellers. I love their beliefs of the family life and the man out working and the taking their kids out, schooling, homeschooling them and making money. The wee kid, the wee boy was only 13 and his dad's giving him a grand a week. He's out grafting with him working. Like, I love the travellers because yeah. they're fucking mad and they support their own you know and what? they're loyal. Same as the Scousers. Like, I just love it because there's something about it I can resonate with, the madness. Yeah. The Scousers are just... They are tap, man. You're yeah, fucking are. mad, but, and I love and that. And I'm quite reserved because you're I'm not like a really, proper but <laughs> you, you think that as well. But because you're in your masculine and your feminine, sometimes yeah, you yeah. probably not know who the fuck you are yeah. because you're probably strong in both sides. Yeah, and I think that's why it was a great place to start in Liverpool as well because naturally we are like that. Do you know what I mean? Like we've got that culture of you know you stick together. You know everyone looks out for each other. Um, and yeah, I remember going through that shit and especially like, you know, Hannah, like, bless her. Yeah, shout out to Hannah, I love Hannah. Yeah, yeah, she's she's amazing and like, hey, like, friend Carl, like, they were there straight away, they were like, what, who the fuck? Because they knew, like, I'm, I'm a nice person, I come with, with, I don't, I'm not out to harm anyone, I'm here to bring nothing but good. Obviously, you know, you are going to piss some people off along the way, you're going to offend people, you can't go, you know, if you're scared of, of offending anyone, you're never going to do anything in your life, are you? So... Um, yeah, I think it just come from pure jealousy and there was like so much hate online. And I think um, it was hardest for my mum and for like Carl to see my husband as well because I was like, I'd never experienced that before, James. It's like, mm. it was mad. Like how, I don't know how people in the public eye do it because once one person attacks you, everyone jumps on like a witch hunt. Like it's fun. Like I kick her while she's down, but you're a fucking human being and you've got feelings 
you know what I mean? And I, I, I thought I'd been through so much shit, but I remember at that point, like, I remember going outside in the garden because I felt like I couldn't breathe. Like, I was like... <sighs> And it was anxiety, like waking up, and and I was so blessed. I was so lucky. I have four healthy daughters. They had this fantastic club. Nothing was going to change. No customer was not going to come through the door. People were like, I was getting so many amazing comments. Such, you know, people were stopping me, and loads of girls were coming to the club. But sometimes, like, you know, one negative can outweigh a hundred positive, can't it? And now I look back, and again, that developed because I'd never gone through that before. Now I'm so grateful for them people because every time a little negative comment comes up, like, for instance, opening the third venue. Um, sometimes, James, because you're only human, like, you know, and having, like, fucking rage and ADHD, I'll go through life. Like, it's, like, the only way to describe it is trying to do 60 mile an hour in second gear. You're, like, every mm. day. So there's the odd day where you wake up and go, you know, I can't be asked. Like, and I just ignore my phone because mentally I can't talk to anyone. And I'll go home and I'll sit with, you know, because I obviously rescue cats and that's something that, um, that's my therapy and I'll go home to my cats and that's just pure and me, me dog and it was just pure love um, and I'll be like they, they they heal me you know what I mean That that's like my safe place and I'll go home and I'm like I don't want to fucking speak to anyone and then someone will just kick the fucking bee's ass you know what I mean and say something and I'm like fucking don't mm -hmm. and it's great because it gives that fire back in you so I'm so grateful because it just it, it the unknowingly the like i think if everyone's just like you boss you're smashing it you're like oh sounds you get comfortable don't you yeah. but when when you're forced you know for instance like rude getting sold you've got to get off with this new strip club's coming up for sale well if i don't get it someone else's this tv show well if i don't get it someone else's it's like it, it, it constantly keeps you on your toes and unknowingly like you know you could say i'm being dragged along but it's like i'm gonna be that fucking person until i say stop and i call the shots and until i decide i'm done i'm, I'm no one's no one's moving me do you know what i mean and i've got to a point now where it's like i've gone through that much what's the worst that can happen i've got everything that i could ever want if the club shut down tomorrow they might do me a favor because my life at the moment is just so consumed to the point where like I was saying to you earlier, if I need a break, I need to go away. And even then, if I go away, I'll find something to do. Do you know what I mean? I end up in the hospital with like sterilising cats because that's just who I am. I've constantly got to do something and make a change. I've got to have a purpose. Otherwise, I would just be depressed, which I found out through having a baby and staying at home. That's not me. I can't. I wish I could. You know, I wish I could switch off, but... But that's the um, ADHD or whatever the fuck really yeah, was. People but, have got you know what? Do you take anything for that? No, I don't because I can control it. And it's some, there's different variations of it. So some people can be really bad and they need to. I'm not. Um, I know I know how to control it. And I know I've found things. So you can have like an addictive personality. So I've been really lucky that I think because I grew up with such a strict upbringing with my dad that I've always... It, I've always thrown it into me work and then I've never been um I've never been tempted into you know I, I work in a party you know what I mean that's my job to control the party like sometimes I see everything so sometimes I'll, I'll be out with Hannah and like we always end up in roots and I'll, I'll get the club and we'll get on a stage side booth and I'll be texting the barman to bring dollars up. No one in that club knows I'm the owner because I'm not in my work attire. I'm, I'm, you know, out and I'm giving Hannah dollars. I'm giving her dollars. And they're like, wow. And I'll be there, James. Like, And the DJ's putting the songs on that I'm telling them to put on and I'm doing this. And it's about like you, you creating a moment in within the club and then it works because then he's getting dollars, she's getting dollars. The girls are loving it because they're not... It's not just about the money, it's about the appreciation you're getting on the stage and people are applauding you. It's, you know, it's a fantastic feeling. Um, so now it's like it enables me to see absolutely everything and tap into everything and I'm actually grateful for it. I, I, it doesn't consume me because then I go home and I live this complete, I live a very peaceful life. Like I go home and my work is so fucking sexy, you know, when it's like, I can get away with so much that men couldn't, you know what I mean? I walk in and I'm like nice tits and grabbing it and doing this and, you know, all obviously consensual, but dressing the girls up and it's like, it's it's super sexy and I listen to their conversations and they're so raw and you think men are bad fucking hell. Those women in the change rooms, the conversations they have. Ruthless. Yeah. Um, Where do you go forward for the future with it all though? Do you know what? You've kind of completed that. You've got the biggest in the UK. Yeah. Where can, because in America... 
it's more accepted in the UK. We don't accept it for some reason. I don't know, but um, it's each to their own. But where do you go forward with the future with it all? Uh, do you know what? I don't know. Like I've sat there before today and I've gone, right. Um, do you need bad shit to happen to then kickstart you again to move on with it? Because oh. you seem as if you can get complacent, but you seem to have a good setup with it all. But you obviously seem to work better when the shit hits the fans yeah, for some yeah, reason. Yeah, when you kick the bee's nest to go go wild. Um, so at the moment I'm running, you know, I've got I've got three clubs within within Liverpool. Um, I don't know, James, like, you know, I tapped into London and I've had a lot of interest. It scares me. Um, but then obviously what, you know, what scares you is what, it, that's, what's, that's what's good for you, isn't it? You know, you've got to reach out and do those things. But I don't know. Like, there's, I get a lot of, um, there's a lot of things with TV and then I think, do I, do I want that? Do I really want that? Is that what excites me? Do I want to go to London? Because then going through like a little with COVID and then going through like all the shit that I went through with the show, it was like I went away and then started rescuing these cats and got so invested into working with these charities. I was like, I need to be at home because I've got a huge responsibility and that's what brings me so much peace. So I question day to day, do I want to go and live that city London life or do I want to just work? I need to be here. I earn too much money to stop. But then at home, my life's completely different. You know, I'm the most unsexiest person in the world. A new fluffy house coat sat with like go to sleep and wake up and there's eight cats and but that's like that that makes me happy that brings me so much peace so i don't know do you know what I mean? as long as long as it feels right i'll say yes to everything and i just keep going um what, what makes a good entrepreneur what makes a good entrepreneur um i think what makes a good entrepreneur is consistency you've got to be consistent in what you're doing you've got to show up no matter how how you feel Except that there's going to be, you know, there's going to be bad days. It's just, it's a bad day. You get over it. Do what you need to do. If you need to go and rest, come back. You know, you do that. Um, and just don't, don't give a fuck. Don't ever. If I could go back in time, I would never, ever have explained myself because I went into COVID, those doors shut, and no one was knocking on my door to pay my bills. Do you know what I mean? So it's just like, just, just look out for yourself. Just be true in what you do. Do it with good intentions and just work. You know, go at it. Be passionate. If you believe in something and you're passionate about it, as long as you enjoy it, just go for it. I think like, I think it's naive to say you're always, we're all going to make money from something we enjoy. You know what I mean? If you find something and it drives you and you can earn a good living from it, just fucking just go for it. And just, yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's an endurance test being an entrepreneur and I've given up so many times, not of recent back, you know, back in the early days. And um, it was a test of like, of strength as to how strong am I? Can I do, you know, can I do this? And there was many times that I, I'd give up and I was quitting and someone else was going to run the girls and I'd go away and, um, It'd last a fucking day or two and then I just thought me, I thought, James, you know what I mean? And go back in with like, some sound. But now it's fine because I think you learn. Um, back then, I was giving all my energy to the girls in the club where now I've realised that you have to fill your own pot. So I'm really, you know, I got my dog and that was like, I got my dog during COVID and that was um, one of the, he's like one of the best things that ever happened to me because he's just, you know, the love of your dog is so pure. And when the world was going crazy and you're losing faith in humanity, it was like I'd go home to the dog and so that's my thing now is when shit, you know, I feel me egg going a little bit, I'll just go on a big walk with the dog, come back and I'm sound and it's just finding those things to keep, to keep oh. you, you kind of like your mind. Stable. Yeah. How are you feeling now? Good, good. It's all right on that? Yeah, you wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to finish up on anything else, Amy? No, no, just like thank you so much for having me on. Listen, keep smashing it, keep doing what you're doing. Listen, you're going to get stick because of that industry. That's just the yeah, way men yeah. are. And women, especially being a female boss. And then, obviously, stripping and all that. But listen, people are going to talk shit. But fair play to you. If people are happy, you're not harming anyone. I'll support you all, all steps of the way. Thank so you. I wish you nothing but the best for the future, babe. God bless you. And uh, thanks for today. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>